Let me hit the record button here. And let's try that again. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Global Math Department. My name is Lee Natero, and I'll be your host tonight. Tonight, we're going to be hearing from Eli Luberoff about his topic, If You Let Your Students Surprise You, They Will. Would everyone please introduce themselves in the chat, telling us what you teach, where you teach, and what your Twitter handle is, if you have one. All right, I'm glad to see so many people here tonight, some familiar names. I see Lebo there. Lots of other people as well. Sarah, I recognize that name. All right, welcome everyone. So feel free to share your Twitter handle, what you teach and where you teach. Oh, we got a good crew right. here. Yeah, we do. We've got uh, 31 people here. Fantastic. And I don't want to blow up anyone's spot, but I think that we might have a Desmos Global Art Contest winner among the folks in attendance. That is amazing. All right. Mm -hmm. We got people from the East Coast and the West Coast. And usually we have an international uh, person or two here. All right. So before I um, introduce our speaker, I, I'd like to explain how these meetings work. These meetings are recorded and are available within 24 hours after the meeting ends. To view the recording, you would use the same link you used to get here tonight. The global math community prides itself on being friendly and supportive. The chat room is available for topical and general conversation throughout the meeting. I'll be sure to catch your questions for the presenter to be addressed at the end of the presentation. Um, our speaker tonight is Eli Luberoff. And Eli uh, began his programming life on the TI-83 graphing calculator in elementary school, um, which obviously is quite ironic considering he is also the founder of Desmos. Um, in 2011, he combined his interest in technology and learning to found Desmos, which makes products that support millions of people in teaching and learning mathematics. And my guess is so many of you are here tonight because you either love Desmos or you're very curious about how to let your students surprise you. And so I'm going to turn the presentation now over to Eli. I am so excited to be here. Uh, thank you, Lee. Um, thank you to everyone who's taking some time out of your night for this. Thank you especially to a few folks. Um, I want to give a shout out to, uh, among others, Norma, whose wonderful daughter also is um, a data scientist at Desmos and doing absolutely incredible work. Um, but what I want folks to do to begin our time together today is if you're looking at my screen, you should see a link if you go to student.desmos.com and a class code. And please uh, type that in and we're going to start doing a little bit of mathematics. Um, if you need that link later on, and for folks who join later, if you could help uh, let them know that it's pinned at the top of the chat window. Are folks able to see that, where there's a link up at the top, student.desmos.com join? Um, and there's three screens to start this off. The first one is, I just want to know how folks are doing today. And then it's followed by two little bits of mathematics that you should go forward to. Um, and I'm going to tell some stories about those. So I'm going to give folks just a minute or two to get in, get acclimated. Um, hello, Daniel from Massachusetts, my home state. Um, and let's, uh, let's get prepared to do a little bit of math today. I'm going to warn you, I think we've got an hour and I'm planning to rush through it, probably manage my time poorly and not get to the end of the presentation. Uh, so please forgive me in advance for that. Um, is it okay if I hide this modal that has the code? Do folks have access to that? And people are generally in. Yep. I think everybody can top. see it in the, the uh, and it's definitely pinned at the top. So if they need it, they can get to it later. Fantastic. All right. Let's uh, let's dive in. I just want to see how folks are doing. Um, this is a, a screen that you should feel free to add to any lesson that you want. Um, if you have questions on how, ask it in the chat. And I bet that someone there can answer uh, about our starter screens. And I'm very pleased to see that uh, folks are doing pretty okay for the most part. Um, I've got you anonymized so that there is no concern with any of the answers that you're going to do being shared um, and seeing that there's both 
tiredness and excitement. We've got a webinar. I'm excited for spring to be here soon. Excited to hear from someone named Eli. Um, what I want to do is go on to screen two. And if you haven't yet, please head over to this screen where I've asked this uh, challenge here of dividing a rectangle into four pieces. And you've got a sketch tool so that you can draw however you want. And I want to give people an additional challenge, um, which is I want you to try to draw something that you think no one else in the room drew. I want you to come up with a different way of dividing it into four equal pieces than you think other people did. Um, once you've got an answer that, you, uh, that you're that you proud of, feel free to try to extend yourself in that way. And I'm just going to look at what kind of things are coming in. Uh, feel free if you want to look at my screen and you're going to see some examples of what other people are doing. And so you can use that as an opportunity to try to come up with something that you think no one else will. Oh, and I'm seeing some fun stuff happen already. Here we go. I was hoping for this one. So we get a few folks who divided it into uh, four equal pieces like this. Um, we've got a few folks who did three vertical lines, and we've got this one person who did three horizontal lines. All of these are wonderful, brilliant, creative answers. Um, these are kind of fun. So folks dividing them into triangles in a couple of different ways, like this and like this. I'm going backwards. And then I think that I saw someone who did triangles. Oh my goodness. Look at this. This is beautiful. I've never seen this one before. Um, take a look at my screen. Oh, it changed. Take a look at my screen. Um, and this beautiful way of dividing it into four equal pieces. So I was given this problem as a second grader, and it is one of my first and strongest memories of math class. And also one of my most negative memories of math class. Um, and the story is that what I did in second grade was I drew this picture here. I drew this diagonal and my teacher told me that I was wrong. Um, it was a quiz and I got it wrong. And it was one of the first times that I'd been given that type of feedback. And it was devastating to me for a couple of reasons. Um, the first one was it felt really high stakes and I got it wrong. But the other one was that I'm convinced that these four pieces are equal. And I would love for folks in the chat here to make both an argument in favor and an argument opposed to the idea that these four triangles are equal, that I divided this into four equal pieces. Let's see some arguments in the chat. Okay, so Karen is saying that these are equal but not congruent. We've got someone who said they don't look the same. That's true. What does the same mean? Um, so I interpreted this question as they need to be equal in area. The teacher posing it apparently wanted congruent. Um, so the link to the content here, if you look at the very top of the chat, there's a link that will let you get in. Um, and here we've got a way that we can actually see that they are equal in area. And this is actually what I did. I came in the next day and I said, look, I can prove it to you. I probably didn't use those words. I said, look, these are actually the same because each one of these is made up of two triangles and the triangles are the same as each other. And I was told, nevertheless, still wrong. I wanted you to make triangles that were the same and or I wanted you to divide this into equal area and you did not. And it was devastating. This is one of my first and strongest memories of math class. Um, I also like to reflect on that memory because in my now 35 years of life, there have been very, very, very few instances where I have been told or indicated or gotten any cue that my thinking is not valued in a math classroom. Um, and nevertheless, that one time it stuck with me in such a hard way. And I can't help but think about all of the people that get these cues every single day from society, from their classmates and from their teachers that uh, their ideas are not valued in a math classroom. It's one of the things I am determined to do. And I imagine uh, the folks on this call are determined to do is to make as few people feel that way as possible. Um, and especially folks who are historically told that they are not math people to not be. So this is an example of when I was told that my ideas were not valued. 
Um, let's go on to the next one, which is a memory that I have that is extremely uh, positive of math class. This was, I don't actually remember what grade, but I remember being given this problem, which is that if you add four, five, and six, you get 15. And my challenge to folks here is uh, to see if you can find any other sequences of consecutive integers. Um, this here should be integers, consecutive integers that add up to 15. And I'm seeing some folks in here. Uh, we've got seven and eight. We've got one, two, three, four, and five. We've got a question about not consecutive um, or not integers. For the sake of this, we're going to say they have to be consecutive and they have to be integers. Um, there's some really fun extensions about what if we allow consecutive fractions? What if we allow um, an arbitrary mathematical sequence that jumps by bigger amounts? But here we've got a few. I want to see how many more we can find. Uh, so Benjamin Banneker here, um, anonymized mathematician, did 357. We are not going to count that one for the sake of this, although that is some brilliant mathematics, because we're just looking for sequences of consecutive integers. Um, and so far, if I had a, a whiteboard in front of me, I would say, all right, we've got four, five, and six. We've got one, two, three, four, five. We've got seven and eight. Are there any others that folks can find? So I've got three sequences so far. And I'm going to give it a minute. All right, we've got some folks trying to start at negative one. I'm curious if that's gonna work. We've got someone starting at negative six. Oh boy, I'm excited to see how this one plays out. So I think this sequence, negative six, going all the way up to eight, I think that's gonna work because I think the negative six up through the six are gonna cancel and we're gonna have a seven and an eight. So we now have four sequences that work. Oh my goodness, we've got this person counting down from 15 to negative 14, I think that's a fifth sequence of consecutive integers that adds up to 15. Here's a fun one. Someone started at zero and went to five. I think that's a sixth. We've got negative three to six. I think that's a seventh. So I see right now, seven sequences of consecutive integers that add up to 15. Does anyone see any others? I'm gonna make the claim that the sequence of consecutive integers that consists just of the number 15 also satisfies the requirement here and that gives us eight. And we're not gonna do it here, but I'm gonna claim that that is the limit. And I wanna see if anyone can find any beyond eight these eight sequences that we found that add up to the number 15. And then what I want folks to do, because I ended up spending days on this question and asking extensions, and what if it was adding up to 16 instead of 15? And why are there eight of them? And how do we figure out what they are? And there is just so much depth hidden in what seems like a really simple question. And so I brought up these two examples because they're both examples to me of surprise. The first one here was an example where the response that I gave to a teacher surprised the teacher. And instead of that being welcomed, it was shot down. And the second one was a time that I was surprised by a really, really fun piece of mathematics. And both of these are two of my very strongest memories of math class. So if you will indulge me and feel free to keep working on this, asking yourself some of those same extensions if you want to about how many add up to 16, how many add up to 17, what numbers are special, why are there eight? of these sequences. Feel free to keep pondering on that if you don't want to hear my voice and look at my screen, which is fine. And I want to just talk a little bit about why I'm so obsessed with surprise and have been now for my entire professional life um, thinking about math. Um, so the first is that surprise is a fuel of learning. I, there's research going back to Piaget and I assume before about learning happening when you are destabilized, when you think that you have a deep understanding and then it is um, thrown asunder through some new 
factor piece of information and then you need to reconcile it. And the process of that is so much of learning. Surprise is where this learning happens. Um, the second one here is that surprise is a sign that you're asking a really interesting question. I think if you're asking a question where you can predict every single answer that's gonna come back, it's probably not interesting enough. We think about this in almost everything that we do. Um, this one is kind of selfish, um, but surprise is a sign that you're building a powerful product. Um, once again, if you're building something and you can predict exactly how it's gonna be used, it's probably not all that interesting as software goes. Um, and for this one, I think back to the graphing calculator that Desmo started with, and the first time that I saw people making art using it, which I did not anticipate at all, I think none of us did. And ever since then, I've taken a feature as being a really powerful, delightful, fun feature. If people end up using it in ways that I didn't anticipate, like that's the most joyful feeling when designing a product, um, is does someone use it in a way that you didn't expect? And there could be an inclination to say like, oh man, you're using it wrong. We didn't want you to do it that way. I instead take that as a sign that we have done something kind of special with that particular feature. Um, on, the, on the challenging side of welcoming surprise, surprise is, surprise is a sign that you're ceding control and allowing mistakes. Um, I think about this as the leader of a company, um, that if I'm not allowing surprise, if I'm not letting people have enough control that they can do things that I wouldn't have done or that I didn't anticipate, then I'm not actually ceding any control um, and I'm not actually allowing for mistakes. And that means that I am hoarding the power in an organization. And I think that this is true in a classroom as well. Allowing for surprise means that you are allowing for mistakes, means that you're allowing for power to be held not just by yourself. Um, this is true in organizations. This is true in math classes. This is true in presentations, but I understand here that none of you is allowed to talk. You just need to chat. And so not a ton of room for surprise as a presenter here. Uh, but I love that when I'm doing an actual presentation live. Um, this, for the record, is only the second time I've done this. So please, afterwards, tell me every way that I can make it better. Um, as a result of this, uh, allowing for surprise can be really uncomfortable. I think it was for my second grade teacher. Um, the perception that uh, as a teacher, you're supposed to kind of be in control and know everything um, is kind of ingrained and it's hard to shake. Um, and this is true also as the leader of a company. Um, it can be uncomfortable to let yourself be surprised, to step back and be like, hmm, I didn't think about that. I'm not actually sure what to do with that. I need to think more. I'll get back to you. Um, those are maybe uncomfortable things to say, uh, but signs I think that you're doing things right. Um, and when I reflect on why surprise is so important to me, um, as with almost everything that I do when I reflect on it, uh, it often comes back to this framework, the dimensions of equity from Rochelle Gutierrez. I don't know if folks have um, are, are familiar with this. I would uh, love to spend a full hour just talking about the, the brilliance of this framework, um, but I can't because we've got a whole bunch of math to play with. Um, but often when folks think about equity, it's along this axis here that is called the dominant axis in, in her conception of it, um, which is you know playing the game. It's um, is access something that is equitably granted? Is achievement happening in an equitable way? Um, but both of these are along like, here is what um, we being whoever is deciding and setting up the space of a math classroom or company or, or whatever it is, um, here's what we're deciding uh, should be happening. And is that happening in a way that is equitable? Um, whereas uh, Gutierrez also focuses deeply on this axis called critical, which is the one that says, um, is power something that is equitably shared? Is identity something that is equitable? Are people allowed and welcomed to bring their identity into a space and are they welcome to change that space? And this is the axis that is most aligned with surprise and most interesting to me. Um, all right, so that's just a little bit of a uh, ramble to start this. What I would love to do is go back to our activity. And I just want to show six concrete ways. We will definitely not have time to do all six, but six concrete, easy things to try to invite surprise into your classroom. Uh, easy is very relative. Some of these are easy. Some of these are, are quite uh, challenging, um, but to invite these in and make surprise a fixture of your classroom. So the first one I already did, I already demoed, which was when we were drawing that rectangle, 
I just added this tiny little prompt and we put this in a few places in our curriculum and you can do this um, with any question. It doesn't need to be in Desmos, of course. Just say, ask uh, the students to try to give an answer that no one else will. This is the most likely way to end up with an answer that you didn't predict, including one that will uh, probably delight you. Um, and then we've got five others that we are gonna try over the course of the next 40 minutes. Are folks ready to buckle up and try to get through way too much content in 40 minutes? I'm gonna wait for just a tiny bit of affirmation in the chat window. All right, we got woohoo, this is all that I need. Amazing, let's do this. I'm gonna unpause the activity and we are going to start with two examples of a thing that is just going to completely and utterly uh, destabilize students in the best possible way. Math classrooms are so um, associated with questions that have a right answer and the goal being to get the right answer. Um, and what we're gonna do here is instead flip that on its head by asking a question that doesn't have a right answer. And in fact, explicitly doesn't have a right answer. So the first one is a classic, which one doesn't belong, which is this beautiful, beautiful um, framework that uh, I, I've seen all over, all over Twitter. I actually don't even know the genesis. I know that it was introduced to me by Christopher Danielson um, on our team, um, where the beauty of this question is you're asking which one of four things doesn't belong and every single one of them has a justification and many of the justifications are going to be ones that you don't expect. Um, so we'll just play a little bit with which one doesn't belong. And then I wanted to show an example of where we put this in another uh, lesson in a totally different place, where again, it's really clearly set up that there is not a correct way to do this. And as soon as you allow and indicate that there's going to be many different correct ways to do things, you're much more likely to get a response that surprises you. And students are going to be much more likely to think, my job here isn't to read your mind. My job here is to think on my own. So let's look at some of what's coming in on these. Which one doesn't belong? It looks like uh, very few people are choosing this third option, the two by five by one stack. Uh, so if you are so inclined, feel free to pick that one and uh, figure out or explain why it is that it doesn't belong. Oh, this is a gorgeous response. I've never seen this one. So claiming that the cube is the only one because all of the other ones have an even number of green tiles. That's beautiful. I've never seen that one. Oh yeah, and uh, Mary Barassa has the which one doesn't belong. Uh, .ca, Mary is absolutely wonderful. Check out that website, which ones don't belong up the wazoo. Um, I love this one. I've never seen that as the reason for the cube. Um, you can also, we've got someone it doesn't belong because I just don't like it as much. Um, this one is going to tip over the most easily. That's such a fun one. And that's such accessible mathematics, but there's actually really interesting stuff there. It's got the smallest surface area on the bottom, um, which is going to be correlated with how tippy it is. Um, love, love, love this reason that it doesn't belong. The other thing that you can do is celebrate responses that are surprising to you. The best way to get students to surprise you more is when they do to be like, oh my God, that's amazing. I never thought of that. This is how you are going to get um, more and more surprised. All right, let's go on to screen five as folks have time. Um, this is a, uh, a really different task, which is that you're just given a bunch of different implements for drawing um, and you've only got three containers to put them in. And uh, I would love to see some of the different ways that folks organize these. Um, and while you're, once you're done doing that, if you are interested, uh, I want you to guess where in the math curriculum you think this screen shows up. We do this for a very, very particular purpose. Oh, check this out. One of our anonymous mathematicians is Rochelle Gutierrez, the very person we were just talking about. 
Oh, Leah thinks this might be for combinations. Love this, love this. This would be a great combinations permutations. Any other guesses? We got ratios, we've got like terms, all wonderful ideas. It's none of those yet. No one's gotten it yet. Sorting, this could absolutely work for elementary, yep. But it's not that. All right, and I'm gonna show some of the um, arrangements that folks did. Um, so we've got this one, which is a total blast. It's by height of the different elements. Um, this one combined all of the ones with a tip. It was by the nature of the tip. Uh, this one is by color. Um, here's one of my favorite responses though. So I saw a few people who were frustrated that there were only three containers, but this person said, you know what, actually there's four containers. We could actually leave one out of all of the containers. And so this was a sneaky way to divide it into four groups instead of three. And I just love that. Um, the part of the curriculum that we do this is for histograms. We've seen dot plots and histograms is all about bucketing and it depends on how big you make the buckets. And so saying, how would you divide these into two? How would you divide it into three? How would you divide it into four? is a pretty nice lead-in to thinking about categorizing in groups uh, as histograms. So it shows up in our, I believe, seventh grade curriculum or sixth grade curriculum as an introduction to histograms. All right, this was just method number two. We got to keep jetting. Um, so we've got this idea of you will get more surprise if you ask questions that don't have a right answer and really, really celebrate the responses that surprise you. All right. Here is our next method. This is a classic. It builds on top of notice and wonder as a wonderful routine. Um, but this one is tell a story. Um, and this one was recommended to uh, us for, for some types of questions by, I think it was Christelle Rocha, who is a Desmos fellow, and said, if you really, really want to engage more students, um, try asking students to tell a story. There's a lot of cultures where storytelling is just a really, really natural form of discourse. So we're gonna spend um, a minute or two watching this video and tell a story uh, and we will all be delighted and surprised by what we see. And while you're doing it also, feel free to guess what math unit this one comes from. We got linear equations, we've got rates of change, both of those. Here's a delightful story to me. It wasn't even a race. They weren't racing each other. They were both just trying to get to school on time. Adrian says uh, systems, and that is correct. This is an opening for systems of equations, um, systems of linear equations. Uh, wonderful guess. Um, but this is another method and it just shows up in a bunch of different places watch a video and tell a story. And it's in a lot of ways, a more inviting routine than notice and wonder. Um, everyone can tell a story. Uh, Annalise says, tried this with eighth graders. It was so helpful to talk about graphs with turtles. 
This one is called Turtle Time Trials, um, and it is free on our site for anyone to use. But we are actually going to race ahead. Are we? Yeah. We're going to race ahead, and we're going to try method number four. All right. Method number four is to ask for a drawing. And the reason that I chose this specific screen is that you can ask for drawings to show up in all sorts of fun places. Um, this is an example where it isn't maybe the most natural context for a drawing, but it ends up working so, so well. So in this one, it's our introduction to inequalities and we wanted a context that was really visceral where an inequality mattered and we thought that height limits on bridges would be a pretty natural context for that. But rather than just asking students, is this vehicle gonna fit under the bridge? We ask them to draw a vehicle that does or does not fit under the bridge. And I would encourage you to try both because it's just kind of fun um, to watch the vehicle both fit and not fit uh, into the tunnel. This one we're gonna spend a few minutes because drawings are worth it. Oh, Ingrid's playing around with colors. We've got a, a two color. <laughs> I think I see here a flying taco. Um, very, very uh, impressive looking vehicle. We've got a bike. We've got another bike. Fun challenge. Who here actually knows how to draw a bike? I certainly don't. We've got a penny farthing bike. Is this one gonna fit? I'm so curious. It doesn't. That's why they had to invent the safety bike. I would say the greatest invention of the last 150 years. Oh, look at this vehicle with the smiling face on it. And we got this one here with colors. This one gets into a fun vehicle chat. Is this even a vehicle? What is a vehicle? Um, it's another classic Christopher Danielson book in the works um, of is it a vehicle? A person on top of a vehicle. This one could get a little dicey. I think it's not going to make it. <laughs> that was rough. I regret playing that video. Um, but yeah, we've got some really great artists here. And one of the things that you'll find is that in your classroom, uh, your students are just so multi-talented and you will be surprised by which ones of them thrive when asked to do a drawing um, of, of this type. And we can then celebrate um, all of the different bits of creativity here. The Desmobile, yes. Um, I think that one of our lessons features the Desla, uh, Desmos Tesla. Um, is it a vehicle? Yes, this is indeed related to sandwich chat. I think vehicle chat might actually be a hashtag on Twitter that you should feel free to check out. Um, all right, so this is method number four, which is drawing a picture. I wanna spend, um, I intentionally tried to reserve a bunch of time for methods five and six. And I also want to have a little bit of time for questions. Um, so for folks watching this later, I'm sorry, this might not be quite as fun as doing it live. Um, but for those doing it live, we're going to play around with one of my favorite features, um, which is called Challenge Creator. And the premise of this is that um, so much of Math class is this just like really paved pathway of here are the set of questions that we think uh, is going to lead to the conclusion that we want you to have. Um, or here are the steps laid out piece by piece to solve a specific question. Now follow the exact same steps to solve the same question with different numbers. And there's so much interesting thinking that gets kind of hoarded in that structure by the person writing the book or the person teaching the class. 
And asking questions is such an interesting way to think and such an interesting way to shift that power and to allow for surprise. Um, and so we uh, have a bunch of different places that we let students ask questions, but here is one of my favorite constructs. It's a thing called Challenge Creator and folks should now be on the Challenge Creator. Um, if you happen to get stuck, um, if you reload the page, it should let you come forward. And the way that this one works is that you're going to make a task for your classmates to solve, and then you're going to solve it. Um, and the task here is to compute the area of a polygon on a grid, um, which can be easy or hard depending on the polygon that you make. So I'm gonna just give you a demo here. This is going to be a four by four square, relatively straightforward. So if I say, I think the area of this is 16 square centimeters, we've got one centimeter and I press check my work, um, it's going to try it, it's going to show that I was correct, and I can submit my challenge because I correctly found its area into the gallery. And then once you have made your own challenge, you can answer other people's questions. And so here, I want you to just, we're gonna spend probably eight minutes here, seven minutes here, um, making challenges for each other. Uh, and as per usual, try to make one that you think no one else in the class is gonna make. Try to make one that is very special for you. Very special might be too high of a bar. One that you're excited about and you think no one else in the class will have made. Oh, here we've got a delightful one with symmetry. This one I think wins the prize for simplicity, a one by one square. Alana made hers too hard. You can always go back and make it easier. But making it too hard is part of the joy. Oh my goodness, this one's fun. It's almost the entire space. This one's fun. It's got some really nice symmetry. We can talk about what kind of symmetry. So as we're making these shapes, we can talk about axes of symmetry and rotational symmetries. Oh my goodness, this one is hard. This is hard. I'm gonna focus on this one. I'm gonna do this one while folks are watching. Uh, if you want to, feel free to watch my screen or do it on your own. Um, all right, how are we gonna go about this? So I think what I'm gonna do is do this in a few different pieces. Um, I'm gonna draw a line like this. So I know that the area of this here is one. Um, I'm gonna draw another line here. So I know that this is a triangle that has a base, oh no. <laughs> Sorry, I got out of it. Um, I know that this one has a base of two and a height of uh, one, two, three, four, five, five. So I think that the area of this piece here is five. Um, I'm gonna do the same thing down here where it's got a base of one, two, three, four, and a height of two. So I think the area of this is four. And then this one is a doozy, but I think that we can look at this as a triangle on its side with a base of one and a height of two, even though it's skewed. So I think this one is also one. And I think if I add these up, I have one plus one plus four plus five is 11. And let's see, boom, still got it. So feel free to jump in and solve a challenge that someone else made that looks kind of interesting to you or challenging to you or surprising to you.
I'm seeing some really, really wonderful creations. This is another fun zigzag. I call this the Harry Potter curve. I'm so interested. Look at this one and this one are really similar to each other. We can say what's the same and what's different between Sun Young Alice and Reagan Higgins um, polygons. Hello, Jen. Appreciate the chat shout out. And then what's similar and different between Winifred's and Reagan's? I hadn't even anticipated this, but I feel like we've got a whole lesson that we could do just on shapes that look kind of like this. We've got a whole lesson we could do in here just looking at symmetries. Which ones of these have a vertical axis of symmetry? This is our unit on uh, shapes of arbitrary polygons. Yeah, so encouraging students to show their calculation and not just the final answer. Absolutely, which I tried to, um, which I tried to demo as I was doing it. So if we look at my response, and here I see this one half, which is amazing. This is the full calculation. So we can look at this with the work. Love this. Um, and part of this is that you can go in, and students can also go in and see not just. Um, what other folks said, but even if they did sketching, like let's look at what the creator of this one did. Oh my goodness, it's beautiful. Look at this. So this was by an elimination method, drew a bounding rectangle and then subtracted off pieces. Um, so I just love the variety that you can get here of the different ways to approach solving this kind of problem. We can look at all six of the solutions to this. Uh, so a few people who did Maybe work on paper. I'm going to assume work on paper because this is a hard one to not do on paper. And then look at the author, how deep uh, this, this thinking went. Just love it. Unfortunately, we're going to have to move past this challenge creator because what I would love to do with our last, we've got, I think, about 15 minutes left. Um, I want to spend 10 of it letting you surprise me. And then I want to spend a few uh, making space for Q&A. And so over the next 10 minutes as we're going, if folks could just chat in any questions that you have, which I'll address in the last eight minutes, it could be about this presentation, about surprise, about Desmos, about me, about my mother, who's the best. Feel free to ask questions about her. Um, social security number, I'll absolutely share that on a recorded uh, presentation. Nothing is off limits. Um, would love to just have some to make sure that I can answer folks' questions. All right. So little backstory before I go into the last one. I mentioned that the thing that first made me kind of fall in love with this concept of surprise as a design principle, as a goal of the questions we ask, as a goal of the software that we build, was the way that folks used um, oh yeah, the computation layer for this challenge creator is really fun. You can actually edit it. Um, so you should uh, copy and paste this, uh, copy and edit this activity and you'll be able to see the challenge creator code. Um, all right. The calculator, initially the goal was calculator should be free. It's bananas that they still cost 110 bucks, even though it is, as Lee mentioned, the way that I learned how to program and I will be forever grateful for that. Um, but we did not anticipate that people would use it to do things that went beyond that. And I remember the first, uh, this is maybe like a couple weeks into launching, and I noticed that there were a bunch of graphs of Mickey Mouse. Um, and I emailed one of the creators of this graph, and I'm like, why are you graphing Mickey Mouse on a calculator? That's not what calculators are for. And they said, we were given this project. We just learned about circles and transformations of circles. And our teacher said, hey, draw Mickey Mouse using nothing but transform circles. Um, and it blew my mind. It made me so happy. Uh, and what I've noticed over the years is just progressively more and more and more and more powerful and interesting examples of people using the calculator to do things that people don't expect calculators to do. I think that we might have Leah Simon on this call, and I would encourage folks who haven't yet, head over to desmos.com slash art um, and look at just a few of the 
uh, answers, sorry, not answers, a few of the submissions that folks made to this year's global art contest, which had over 10,000 uh, graphs, every single one of which just does mind blowingly more than I ever conceived our calculator could do. So what I wanna do in our last little bit is combine all of these pieces together uh, into a fun example, which is we're just gonna do a little bit of math art um, together. Um, and we're gonna use a new feature that maybe is unfamiliar to some folks called lists to try to make this graph art happen. Um, and to me, this combines all sorts of things. There's no clear right answer. Do something that no one else is going to do. You've got art, you've got storytelling, you've got you creating the question that you wanna answer. What is it that you wanna make happen? It kind of has all of those different elements of surprise, which is part of how at the very end, I end up being really surprised. All right, so here is the quick demo of this feature that is gonna come in handy lists. I can type an equation and it's gonna graph it. And I can create a parameter here like M and it's going to make a slider. And so now whatever the value of M is, that it's gonna be Y equals that times X. And so as I drag this slider, you're gonna see the curve change um, in concert. Uh, y equals negative one over mx is going to do another kind of fun thing. Like here, I'm gonna plot now perpendicular curves to each other. So this is fun, but one of the things that we maybe wanna do is uh, plot more than one line at once, have m be more than one value. And so instead of m being 1.3, I'm gonna make m one, two, and three, and suddenly I get three different lines. You can use this to do all sorts of fun things. Like I could do m times sine of x, and suddenly I get this kind of beautiful looking thing. There's a lot of power behind this, where instead of being 1, 2, and 3, I could have it be every integer between 1 and 10. And I just type it by doing 1 dot 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 10. This comma is totally optional. Um, and now I get a beautiful looking curve like this. Um, and I could also count by something that isn't one. So for example, I could do something like 0 0.5 all the way up to 10, and now it's gonna count to 10 by 0.5s. I could do one and 1 and 1.1 all the way up to 10, and now it's going to count by 0.1s all the way up to 10. And I can also combine these lists in different ways. Um, I'm gonna try one, I have no idea what it's gonna do. I'm gonna do my y equals mx plus b like this. Now I'm going to make M the list 1 through 10, and I'm going to also make B the list 1 through 10. 1 through 10, and suddenly I get this kind of wild thing where they all converge at negative 1, and we can maybe think about why it is that they converge at negative 1. Um, I also could have made, you know, this one negative, and now it's going to converge somewhere else. But what I want you to do is just play around with using lists to try to make some kind of picture that is exciting to you. I'm gonna be looking at um, what's going on in the chat. Um, and in a couple minutes, I'm gonna dip back in with some even more power features of lists for folks who are curious. But for now, let's just see what kinds of things folks are making. I'm already seeing some things that are fun. Belinda's asking, I often get stuck trying to remember how to do things in Desmos. How do I get the little reminder when I forget how to do things? So here's a couple different methods that I recommend. Um, the first one is our support site, which I think is help.desmos.com. Has a whole bunch of resources and videos and that kind of thing. The second is head over to Twitter and just ask. Maybe do, you know, hashtag Desmos and someone will answer. It might be someone from Desmos. It might be someone from this amazing community. Um, and then the third one is uh, open a graph that looks surprising to you and just look at it because all of the source code is there. You can just always see how it was made, including some of these absolutely wild ones where we can go to, for example, the art contest and open up one of the craziest graphs that we could imagine here, uh, this one here of the Swiss ski slopes. Um, and all of it, you can actually see how it's made. I can see like, how, how are these trees done? And it looks like they're just these curves and I can click on it and see where was that curve defined? It's this one here. I think it's one of these. 
Um, and maybe this will give you a reminder of how to do something. Like here's how I do domain restrictions. Maybe don't look at the R contest graphs uh, when you forget how to do features because they are uh, kind of wild. But if you just open up any graph, it's probably going to have something you want. So Maggie says that she made angel wings and the list feature is super cool. Let me see if I can find that one. I'm gonna briefly unanonymize. Um, and oh my goodness, it is true. This is so cool. Here we've got our angel wings. So this is going to be a sequence of parabolas. Oh, all transformed just using the B term of a parabola, which is so fun because that one is going to keep the shape the same and the intercept the same and just shift it in an interesting way. Um, so we end up with this really beautiful demonstration of what the B term of a parabola actually does. We've got here a sequence of circles. We've got here a bunch of hyperbolas. Karen's asking, how do I feel about the balance of explore, look for surprise activities, and the knee need for real need for checkable activities that can be graded? So I think the short answer is that they are not in conflict. And in fact, I think that they are extremely complementary. Um, for example, the challenge creator that we did is an amazing check for understanding of how well students are able to decompose um, polygons and find area. It's also an amazing check of how uh, well they're able to um, find the area of just a triangle and the different methods. Um, the turtle time trials, like this one is just the introduction and then the whole rest of the lesson, now that we're hooked, is going to be about intersections of linear equations. Um, I don't think that these can, conflict with each other. In fact, I think that the very best activities have huge elements of both. You're gonna have surprising different approaches, you're gonna have surprising different um, answers, but you're going to have incredibly deep insight, including checkable insight into whether uh, they were done correctly. Um, I honestly think that's true even for those two examples I did at the beginning. This one, second grade task about area, Phenomenal for that, even though there's a variety of responses. This one here, the stories, phenomenal way to reason about, in that case, actually factoring of numbers. It comes back to factors, which is wild. So it, it makes the challenge higher, but I think being surprised is not um, in opposition to also having enough correctness that we're able to um, still uh, make sure that we're able to give actionable feedback to students about where they are. Um, a couple of these, definitely to like which one doesn't belong, um, is a different category of correctness. Um, that one you're just looking at, at the reasoning, but hopefully still learning a whole bunch about what students understand. Um, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful and critical question um, where my answer is not in opposition, in fact, working in concert towards building understanding and helping um, us understand what students understand and helping students see the joy and value in the math that they're learning. Uh, Belinda asks if we will have access to the slideshow once the webinar is done. At the end, I'm going to just unpaste it and you're able to come back into this at any point. Um, I'm going to start looking for other questions that came in. I see a question which is 111, 11, uh, 1111. I agree. We've got where in mass am I from? Uh, Amherst. Um, two Desmo shirts, two pairs of Desmo socks. Was that me? Um, I doubt it. I think it was probably someone from our team. I do not know how to use the postal service, um, but I've also been beneficiaries of that. It was maybe from Jenny. It might've been from Kathleen. We have a new storefront. And so now they send it out for us because we were getting a little bit too backlogged. Will the Desmos Fellowship be returning? The answer is absolutely yes. I am not sure if it's going to this year, in part because our team is just so underwater and we don't have a headquarters anymore. And so we need to figure out a new way to approach uh, the Desmos Fellowship. And I hope folks are taking a look at the absolutely stunning art that's showing up here. Well, we do, gonna wait another minute for questions. 
Eli, I don't really see many other questions, but I think people are just loving playing with uh, <laughs> method six here and putting it all together. <laughs> Amazing. Then let's keep playing. <laughs> Oh boy, we got a question. Can I use the list to change color? And unfortunately the answer is yes, and I'm gonna have to demo it. Um, <laughs> so let's give this one a try. This one is gonna be a little bit wild. Buckle up, feel free to ignore me if you want to. Colors and Desmos. Right now we've got six built-in colors. A lot of people wanted to do more colors. And so our idea was how can we do colors in a way that is consistent with all of the other ways that Desmos tries to make math dynamic and visible. And here's the way that we did it, is that we're going to let you make color. There's two different forms. I'm going to use um, RGB, color space, uh, RGB. And in this color space, each one of these is the amount of red, green, or blue light that is going to shine out of that pixel um, on the screen. And it goes from 0 to 255. Why 255? Um, because that's 2 to the eighth minus one, and this all is supposed to fit in one byte. So it's one byte of this, one byte of this, one byte of this. All right, so if I do something like zero, 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 what I'm going to get is black. And if I do 255, 255, 255, I think we might actually go up to 256 because it's in Desmos a, a gradient. We're going to get the color white. If I do all red, which is this one, and none of the other ones, we're going to get, of course, the color red. Okay, but now we can also use lists if we want to. And so the way that I'm gonna do this is have this color be a slider. Let's call it the amount of red. Um, and this I can drag from zero up to 255, like so. And I'm gonna do something just kind of wild. I'm going to make a list. It's gonna go from zero to 10, um, like this. And I'm going to do sine of X and that list. And so now I get 10 of these. And let's just zoom out a little bit like this. Okay. And what I wanna do is have this value here. Now, instead of being a number, I want it to be a multiple of this list. So I'm going to do 25.5 times L and oh my goodness, what do we get? We get a gradient of colors going from no red to full saturated red. And now if I go into here and click on the icon, I've got a new color. I've got the six that I defined or that Desmos defined, plus this new one that I made inside of this graph and bam, we've got a gradient. Um, and just to make that really visible, I'm going to make these lines a little bit thicker. And we can see now that we've got a gradient, a list of colors, each one of them defined as RGB. The other color space that we use is called HSV. I like it much better, um, but it takes a little bit longer to demo. And just to show how dynamic this whole thing is, let's add in some green if we want to. And now same thing, and as I adjust this, the whole thing is going to adjust accordingly. And so now it goes to really green all the way up to uh, horrible. Um, so RGB XYZ is indeed a known function. You need to assign it to a variable if you wanna use it because that's how um, stuff is referenced inside of Desmos. Um, but the thing that it returns is a color or a list of colors. Um, we've got that one. We also have the one called HSV, which we could play with a little bit. So like my new color is HSV, H, S, and V. Um, hue is a trip around the color wheel. Saturation is basically how much of that color there is. And value is a horribly named thing that goes from black to full color. And so with this one, as I change H, it just goes around the color wheel. Um, and then this is going to make it either like all washed out and the, or this one is gonna make it all black. Will the color animate if you play the slider? It absolutely will, just to make this really visible. I'm going to animate the amount of G in each one of these colors, and we're going to watch the whole thing animate live. And I think that is a perfect question to end because I believe that we are at time. I just wanna thank everyone so much for joining me to play with math today, to Lee for setting this whole thing up, to the, um, to the Global Math Department for hosting and doing this just wonderful, wonderful community. That is it from me. Back to you, Lee. Thank you very much, Eli. And actually, you got it in in an hour. You said you might not get it in, but I, I think you did. I think you did. 
So thank you everyone for being here tonight. We really appreciate you and make sure you uh, tell others about Desmos and, and share with them what you've learned uh, tonight. So thank you very much, Eli, for sharing with us. Um, if you have any other last minute questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, and our next presentation is going to be happening in two weeks, March 22nd. The session is called Halt Eight Thinking Thieves. Try to say that 10 times fast. Halt Eight Thinking Thieves with Tracy Jackson. I hope you will be here in two weeks. Thanks for joining us.